All right. Let's start off with the afternoon session. Sit back and relax, folks, because we have an afternoon of um, video presentations uh, from our colleagues uh, from around the world. But we have a great treat to have Diana Juracek with us in person and who will take the stage in due course. But I'm Claire Hall with the great honour of having been invited to uh, kickstart this bracket uh, of, of proceedings. And for those who've come online from around the world um, who, who are joining us, just perhaps having their morning coffee, welcome. We've had a rich, rich morning already. And um, as is customary uh, in this part of the world to acknowledge traditional custodians of the land, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that right now because uh, we have um, been played in. Country was played by Uncle Barry this morning. Uh, so beautifully with his Yudaki, and he called forth ancestors of this ancient place to be with us and our ancestors that we bring uh, together. And so those of you who are online, um, we uh, welcome you into this space with us. And so let's get started with the afternoon. We've, you've missed out, those online, I'm sorry to say, you've missed out on a beautiful sound bath that we had at lunchtime, which was really special. Uh, uh, so we're all kind of really grounded and centred, aren't we? Uh, we've, we've had a very uh, generous keynote this morning from Naomi Sunderland and... Um, two sessions that we're starting to see the threads of our thinking emerging around impact, but perhaps uh, um, in other ways we're thinking through change, what, it is, what is it to be social, uh, what is it to be musical, uh, what is it to connect and how. And so uh, this bracket starts with Diana Juracek, from Canada and her colleague. Is she online? Is she there? Samantha Ty. And let's... Yeah. There she is. Lovely to see your face, Samantha. Uh, let's just play the video and, and we'll take it from there. Let's give them a warm welcome. We are presenting on the project Community Music in Canada. We both live on the Haldeman Tract in the cities of Kitchener and Waterloo, that's southwest of Toronto. The land that we're on was granted to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River, and it is the territory of the Neutral, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. I'm Deanna Yarachuk, the Principal Investigator. And I'm Samantha Tai, the Research Assistant and Technical Director. This project uses video methods to research the competencies that community musicians need to work in culturally complex environments. By culturally complex, we refer specifically to indigenous focused projects and to immigrant focused projects here. Although we do understand cultural complexity is much bigger than that. We wanna focus briefly on two projects and highlight the most important competencies that the artists described in their work. Music from Hope is a community music initiative that was founded by Noor Kadan and Tarek Grary, two Syrian musicians who are currently living and working in Toronto, Canada. They run musical workshops with refugee youth aged 5 to 25 who have recently arrived in Canada and are staying in temporary housing communities. The workshops use sound, songwriting, body percussion, and nonviolent communication to encourage interaction between the youth. When asked about the goal of the program, Noor said, because they don't know each other when they come to the group, they don't know who we are, they have no background in music, we don't demand of them to make music. We don't demand from them an outcome. We want them to participate in a group together, respect each other, have room to listen to each other, and have room to express their ideas. In terms of the competencies needed to do this work, both Noor and Tarek identified improvisation and empathy as essential skills. The music skills that needed for me was to be able to improvise on the spot. Of course, you need to prepare for the workshop. But when you go there and something happened or the kids, they don't like this kind of exercise, let's say. Uh, or or maybe they, they create something from, from my exercise. So you need to improvise. 
and go with him and, you know, and, and change the whole workshop. We did many times. We changed the whole workshop. We changed the whole idea. We changed the whole rhythm we were planning to, to teach the kids because sometimes they just, you know, they just, I'm just, they want to do that. And we are there to, to push them or to give them the space to do this kind of what they feel. You need to keep in mind that in the workshop and we want to accommodate everybody equally. We don't want to give attention to that person without that person. Improvisation in music helps us that if any music, any musician on the stage made a mistake, not to stop and look at that musician. And this is what we use in a workshop. If that kid started yelling or start jumping on walls, we have to all jump on walls because we want to be, you know, this is not weird. This is what we're doing now because this is what they want to do. You know, we're not dictating in the workshop. We're flowing. What Noor and Tarek talk about here demonstrates more than just improvisation, flexibility, or adaptability. It's a radical responsiveness to what participants are bringing into the workshop. The participants are encouraged to engage on their own terms, and non-conventional engagement isn't just tolerated, but celebrated. I believe that this responsiveness is rooted in empathy and a deep understanding of their participants and the context that they're working in. In our interviews, Noor and Tarek touched on their experiences of coming to Canada as refugees and mentioned that this experience helps them to connect with and understand the youth more deeply than someone without this experience might be able to. They understand the complex and often traumatic experiences that the youth are coming from. They understand their anxiety, their grief, their uncertainty, and they structure their workshops in a way that holds space for all of this. This isn't to say that someone without lived experience shouldn't engage in this work. Rather, it demonstrates the immense benefits that shared lived experience can have. The second project is called Nasqua Mahatuan, Let's All Share in the Music. This was a collaborative songwriting project for Indigenous youth in northeastern Alberta. It was initiated by Cahiwan Native Dance Theatre, an Indigenous arts and education organization in Alberta, and they partnered with an organization called Make Music Matter. The goal of the project was to use Indigenous music, languages, and culture to help address the mental health crisis in the communities and other devastating effects of intergenerational trauma. The leaders of the project were all Indigenous. For example, Rosa John is Taino, Melvin John is Plains Cree, and Tony Duncan is Apache. All the leaders held worldviews, knowledge, and values that would be difficult for a non-Indigenous outsider to hold well within the project. One example of this is how they emphasize the sacredness of children in Indigenous teachings and the fundamental healing aspect of music and instruments. Because the youth, the children, they have an energy that's just the most powerful energy. Um, as Indigenous people, they are sacred, our children. The kids are the focus. They are the focus of everything we do. They're the focus of our prayers. They are the focus of our songs. They're the focus of what we feed them. They're the focus of, of who we are, you know, when we're with them. Any instrument that we use in our traditional ways um, has the power to heal. Our traditional drums that we use, you know, is a way to bring us back to that connection that we have to Mother Earth and also reminds us of the connection that we have to our own mother. There was clearly lived experience and extensive knowledge of specific Indigenous cultures and worldviews. The work was culturally specific and culturally sensitive. What we're working here, you know, what we developed here may not work in the woodlands, may not work out west in West Coast, may not work with Inuit. So that's really important is that what we develop here is very, very community. It's up- culturally sensitive for yeah, the area. Yeah. In terms of competencies needed to do this work, that central focus on children was also met with a significant understanding of the impacts of colonization and intergenerational trauma, while also focusing on healing and fun. This immediately tied into building the confidence within the participants. I think that uh, what's really important that to come out of here is songs that are not just about pain. Yes, of course, there's going to be pain 
because a lot of these kids have been through lots of stuff, just like Indigenous kids all over the world have been. We had to look at in terms of healing the child, that emotional part of that child. And the way to do that is that we had to instill confidence in them. We have to say, this is your song, this is your rhythm, this is what it is that you're saying to, to us and to the world. The children always had control over if and how they participated, and they could express themselves honestly. Rosa also emphasized the importance of leaders building trust by following through on what they say. This all created space for the youth to contribute to the songs in meaningful ways. It's that ease of, of I can speak if I want. I can say what I want to say when I want to say it. There's no, um, no, you can't say that. No, you can't talk about that. No, just, yeah, we don't talk about that. You know, there's none of that. And so they see that right away. They notice that. And what happens is knowing that allows them to then redirect it and say, oh, okay, I've got some voice here. I can say something and, and it's okay. And if I don't like something, I can say it. And one of the things that I have learned the most is to just let the kids, just let them go. You know, you let the guitars go. You let the, the keyboard, you let the singer sing. You let this one that just wants to say one word, they can just say one word. <laughs> We've outlined two projects in two vastly different contexts that both use music making as a tool for healing and connection. We're framing this as radical responsiveness. This is more than just being adaptive or flexible. It is centering the participants, their cultural and personal histories, and valuing their contributions that they decide to bring. In both projects, the leaders share the cultural identities with the participants. The leaders also have extensive artistic knowledge and skill through professional experience. We caution leaders outside of these shared identities that this is not a simple cut and paste set of competencies. To provide culturally sensitive facilitation requires time and commitment to build and deepen these relationships. Some projects may not have a leadership role for cultural outsiders, although there may be supporting roles. Music does have the power to heal and to connect if approached with deep cultural knowledge and deep respect for all relationships within the work. Thank you, Diana and Samantha. We'll look forward to discussing that rich work later. And now we have uh, Gabby, Gabrielle Smith, online from Canada, who I believe uh, wanted to be here in person, but th through no um, uh, control of hers, when she was not able to be here. So over to Gabby now. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a PhD candidate and course lecturer at McGill University. I want to start my talk out today by trying to practice what I preach, which in femme pedagogy means bringing my whole vulnerable human self to the learning community. On top of a global pandemic that is being vastly underreported and has been wished away to go back to normal, leaving disabled people like me isolated and sicker, and the impending climate collapse, all of which significantly impact the most intersectionally oppressed peoples, I am exhausted. I'm devastated by the three genocides we are currently witnessing in Sudan, Congo, and of course, Palestine. As my loved ones mourn and my community comes together to work towards organizing and resisting the imperial horrors we are complicit in and watching in real time, it is hard to be here today. I'm trying to ground myself in the work of justice seekers before me and to remember that this is a lifelong struggle, that this is community work, which requires us to take turns resting and resisting, resting and resisting. That no one can be free until we are all liberated and that everyone's liberation is interwoven. In light of these big feelings, I've chosen today the art of Molly Costello. In this art, they state, quote, we are having to unlearn generations of teachings that taught us how to dehumanize and encouraged us to prioritize punishment. In this image, there are three people pulling out burdock root. And in case you don't know, burdock root is a plant that grows deep 
solid roots. And when you cut off just the flower on top, it has no impact on the root system. The plant will continue to grow and propagate. The flowers dry up and turn into seed pods, which then get stuck on animals and get propagated throughout the forest. And then more deep burdock roots get formed. I think of the burdock roots as settler colonialism, as imperialism, as white supremacy, which needs to be pulled out by the roots, which needs to be fully eradicated for us to be liberated. Kindergarten and higher education institutions across Canada have stated the need for a shift towards more equitable, diverse, and inclusive practices. Institutions are looking to reimagine teaching and learning to more effectively counter oppression, racism, and white supremacy. According to Westerlin, much of the curricula and pedagogical approaches in music education programs show Canadian post-secondary institutions remain entrenched in a static and siloed system of colonial practices, which hinder the liberatory potential of music education. Heteronormativity, whiteness, Eurocentric perspectives, and able-bodied centric classrooms, as well as class privilege, are social norms still perpetuated in the broader school environment. To date, the change taking place in post-secondary institutions offers little more than additive or superficial treatments of diversity, such as the addition of a Black composer or a woman conductor, an added EDI committee, to otherwise unchanged course content, pedagogy, assessments, and conservatory-style structures. These gestures of inclusion maintain the power of those who choose to include rather than the forum and power to others to determine the nature and parameters of change that they need. Understanding that we work within institutions that mold music teachers to fit within an educational system rooted in colonial intentions is critically important in focusing our work on dismantling rather than simply reframing, reforming, refreshing, and perpetuating our current model. I position the work that I am presenting today as harm reduction, which can happen alongside the broader abolitionist project of dismantling and dreaming than building just futures. So sometimes you need to cut off the top so the burrs don't keep spreading while we keep working on pulling out the roots, right? My research explores the ways in which music teacher educators across so-called Canada approach liberatory praxis in their own classrooms to shift how we teach and learn. Liberatory praxis is an approach to education which requires teachers to explore not only the intersections of identities which have been institutionally and intentionally excluded, but to also understand and actively expose the power structures which have shaped and continue to sustain systemic oppression in educational spaces and beyond. This work is influenced by Black feminist thinkers such as Bell Hook, Satina Love, Gloria Latson Billings, Indigenous scholars Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang, as well as disability activist Subini Amama, to list a few. Enacting liberatory praxis is not a predetermined process set out in an instruction manual. There's no checklist. The classroom is a space where the intersectional lives of students and the intersectional themes in our course curriculum and varied ped pedagogical approaches meet. As Audre Lorde states, quote, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives, end quote. Therefore, an intersectional approach to teaching and learning necessitates educators to explore and understand the ways in which students lived experiences and the structures of the classroom interact. For this, I propose femme pedagogy. Femme pedagogy is a mode of embodied theory that reaches across complex discourses of resilience, trauma, feminisms, and queerness. It recognizes teaching as care and healing-centered work, which must be grounded in intersectional awareness of embodied experiences. Femme is a queer identity, a verb and framework, which insists that characteristics deemed as feminine exist in us all and rejects normative patriarchal gender construct assigned by settler colonialism and reinforced by their epistemologies. Femme theories explore the role of femininity within the current gendered economies, power structures, and hegemony. It frames femininity and inferiority as pervasive and deeply ingrained in the societal fabric, making femininity integral to understanding and then shifting systems of power and inequality. Families bear what institutions and society ignore and underestimate, that softness and sadness exist in us all. It asks of us to consider a world in which we name those hurts and use them in our journey forward rather than repress them or leave them in the past entirely as patriarchy asks us to do. Vulnerability is feminized in Western culture and like all other feminized objects and subjects, it is typically dismissed or discounted. The field of education continues to center patriarchal settler epistemologies through notions of professionalization, standardization, rationality, independence, and mind over body, which repress vulnerability, care, relationality, compassion, and tenderness. 
Alok Vadmenon asks, quote, what feminine parts of yourself did you have to destroy in order to survive in this world, end quote. If femme means resisting the destruction of the softest parts of ourself in the name of survival, then surely a femme pedagogy works to incorporate those vulnerabilities back into our teaching. What would music education look like if educators applied a femme pedagogy of collectivity, vulnerability, care, and compassion? Through my work discussing with and observing music teacher educators across Canada, one thing is clear. If schools are to fully function as learning communities, the learning experience must be broadened to develop the knowledges and skills of the students as relational and social beings. Relational equality remains an elusive notion in a world that promotes and measurably rewards individuality, but healing and liberation can only occur in community. As such, community building is a skill which pre-service teachers must practice and develop. Here are some of the woven approaches to teaching and learning educators have shared with me in working towards liberatory praxis. Unfortunately, due to the limited time today, I will not explore each concept individually. I just wanted to represent the theory and in some into some of the approaches to teaching and learning that you might be more familiar with. It is possible to mouth the language of liberatory praxis without actually adopting its humanizing values, critical power analysis, and liberatory aims. When transgressive words are used superficially and do not translate to transgressive actions and politics, we risk simply paying lip service and performativity. This praxis challenges the logic of settler colonialism, the dominant paradigm of schooling, but it is also challenged by settler narratives when implemented in schools. Central to settler colonial knowledge, logic is an extreme form of individualism in which human beings are viewed as being fully autonomous agents, solely responsible for the sum of their successes, failures, victories, and hardships. As autonomous individuals, people are stripped of their social contexts and measured as continuously competing with other autonomous individuals on a playing field that is assumed to be level. These discourses of individual responsabilization obscure the failures of the education system, misrepresenting it as colorblind or multicultural and queer friendly, even as it functions to uphold racial hierarchy, heteronormativity and ableist practices. As the responsibility for basic social welfare shifts from communities to individual, blame also shifts such that individuals are increasingly viewed as responsible, even culpable for their own struggles and misfortune. And as such, failure of any kind is viewed as the result of individual irresponsibility and poor choice, not as a community or social responsibility or as a result of injustice. With its focus on healing, growth, and repairing harm, femme pedagogy as liberatory praxis requires those implementing it to address intersectional injustice and oppression and to shift blame from the individual onto the collective. As Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarasina asks, what if our classrooms were spaces where we can bring our sad, sick, messy, vulnerable selves and imagine that care doesn't have to be a sideline to do the real work, but can be the work? What if pre-service music educators held space for one another and understood what community building requires of us? What if music teacher education was built on femme pedagogy as liberatory praxis? just as well we had a sound meditation before. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and I'm, I'm not being facetious that, that my mind is, is racing, my cup's full. Anne Deschamps and Joe Gibson, you've got a, a big task to, to carry on the conversation. Over to you. Hello, I'm Anne, talking to you from Belgium. I've been focusing my professional work for almost 20 years now on participatory arts. At the moment, I do this as a teacher trainer in music higher education, where I introduce my students as practitioners in the field of participatory music, and as well as a professor at Ghent University with a more academic focus. And I'm Jo, um, joining you from London, England, very close to where I was born. I'm a community music practitioner researcher, and I've taught on participatory music practice programs in higher education. I'm a white cisgendered working class woman, all of which shapes my perspectives and interactions. And thank you so much for having us both today. We met through Music for Social Impact, a three-year international research project that considered practitioners' work, contexts and beliefs in Belgium, Colombia, Finland and the UK. 
On screen, you can see a link to the project website for more information. In this presentation, we draw on the perspectives of Belgium and UK practitioners that took part in the study to consider educating musicians for sim practice and some ethical considerations. We'll spotlight three areas. One, practitioner expertise for effective practice. Two, how practitioners prepare for the work and three, preparing for learning by doing, some ethical considerations. For this contribution, we build on two questions that were leading our analysis of the data. First, what expertise do musicians think is needed to be an effective participatory music practitioner? And second, in what ways did musicians prepare for the work? Or what are, according to them, pathways for learning? To answer these questions, we use the Belgian and UK data collected during two phases of the Music for Social Impact research. This included 145 survey responses and 45 semi-structured interviews with musicians active in the field. To analyze the data, we used an inductive qualitative approach with as main methods, thematic analysis and the component comparative method. The leading perspective for our analysis were practitioners' narratives which means we stayed as close as possible to the wordings practitioners used themselves. What expertise does one need to be an effective practitioner in the field? We can distinguish three domains of expertise here, musical, pedagogical and social expertise. In this visualization, you can see the three domains and the themes relating to each domain. So a lot of skills and competences are important and this diagram shows you the complexity of the answer. We will now limit ourselves to illustrating some themes from the respondents' narratives. In the musical domain, it is important that practitioners diversify their musical skills. As one practitioner says, so I bring my guitar with me, I sometimes sing other songs, I bring my violin with me, I play the piano a bit. I believe this diversification is much more important than technical excellence in one instrument. Other important musical skills are playing by ear, improvising and the capacity to be flexible in music. Improvising, easily dealing with we're going to do something different this time, I think that's very important. In terms of pedagogical expertise, it is important that musicians are able to facilitate creativity and initiative, because this way you create a feeling of competence among the participants. This is about creating competence, quick wins, using technology to enable that kid to feel they've achieved something that's culturally responsive to their interests really, really quickly. And as it is the case musically, also pedagogically, practitioners have to be flexible. This means you need to be well versed in enough exercises and techniques to balance structure and flexibility. It involves a lot of running on instinct and especially knowing a lot of exercises, having a lot of resources to be able to come back to things. In the social domain, musicians mention the necessity to be able to relate to and to communicate with people. A practitioner says, in terms of social skills, I would say attention and adaptability. Attention, listening and adaptability is really helping in relationships. An exchange that facilitates that, that is huge. And a social attitude, which is important, is non-judgment and seeing good in people. And I suppose it's seeing the positive side in people seeing people not simply as an offender for something they've done. So how do practitioners prepare for the work? Those that participated in the study said they prepared in many ways, which is reflective of the many ways of participatory music practices. When asked to briefly describe their preparation and training, most practitioners listed several types. Furthermore, what constitutes preparation was thought of in broad terms. This included, for example, talking to others, gigs, 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 books, peer learning, self-preparation, working alongside workshop leaders with considerable experience, travel, attending training sessions, completing accredited courses and degrees, personal experience, including family and lived experiences, and volunteering. Preparation was often considered to be ongoing and iterative. Most facilitators, with or without a higher music education background, mentioned that they learned the most by effectively doing the work in the practice. But although learning by doing is so important in general, we see it comes with different connotations, reasons and understandings. 
first, a lot of practitioners are convinced that the practice actually is the real learning. The main thing is doing it actually, strangely. People need to learn through experience. You know, you can train, you can train, you can train. But until you start actually going into those situations, you won't know. In line with this, a slightly different connotation is that you learn by doing because the learning in this context never stops and you build competences over time. This is a continuous learning experience. In the first few years, I was not well prepared. But with time, you learn certain competences that enable you to cope with many difficulties. Musicians also mention that they learn by doing because they didn't have another option. You know, I've never been trained. I did a music degree so long ago. I learned how to compose, but I've learned through just doing stuff and through setting myself challenges, through trying different things out. If learning by doing is a significant part of cultivating practice, and perhaps foundational if we understand participatory practice as emergent and constituted in relation. As sim practice educators, we must consider how we can best prepare and support students for this experience. Practitioners in the Music for Social Impact study described learning by doing as an intense experience. They used words such as wham, a baptism of fire, and a steep learning curve. Many pointed to the need for care and safeguarding for all concerned. There are still many situations where we are at loss. Certain difficult situations or more complex personalities for which we are not prepared. It was really an energy drain. It was often, especially after a concert, that I felt that I was physically spent or tired the following day, that I needed to recover. You have to be careful about certain things that may trigger, you know, certain pieces of music may trigger traumatic response. Given such complexities, careful consideration is needed when supporting students to learn the hows of participatory practice through doing within music higher education programmes. However, with limited time, we now close with some considerations for music higher education presented from what practitioners say is needed for effective practice. A diverse range of expertise for effective practice. This includes musical, pedagogical, social and other skills. This leads to the question, how relevant is the focus on hyper-specialization within conservatoires for this field of work? Practitioners prepare for the work in many ways and consider many things to count as preparation. They consider preparation to be ongoing, for example, lifelong learning. This leads to the question, could a diversity of preparation be used as a model to radically rethink music higher education? Learning by doing is considered most important. However, practitioners raised issues about support, emotional load and safeguarding. This leads to the question, how can cultures of care and support be built within music higher education to balance openness to the unknown with suitable preparedness? We look forward to considering these questions with you today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Wow. And can you hear us online? Are we good to go? Because I, I, I would love to do something a little different and get you talking to each other because I think you're, in, you're, you're very similar. I can see why they've been programmed together. Um, perhaps the work for us to do is to tease out the higher education part of this theme. But I, f I feel like um, Gabby uh, and and her femme pedagogy, the, that uh, her, her beautiful questions about uh, what can music education look and sound like as, as a liberatory practice, you're doing it. Your, your work is an example. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering if Gabby has questions that she'd like to pose of the other speakers um, in, in, your, in the way you've articulated quite similar things uh, around the complexity, you know, capturing the complexity uh, and responding to complexity, which is 
at what I think is at the heart of, of Gabby's work um, uh, in working and in, in mobilising intersectionality. So, it, and um, so, uh, and likewise, the other way around would, is there things that um, you might like to ask of her. Gabby, <laughs> can you hear? <laughs> I, I did have a question for Gabby, actually. So yeah. that's a great way to start, which is, I, I have a feeling, Gabby, that you talked about the theoretical piece, but in terms of how that plays out in terms of music teacher education, like, I, I, I suspect that's maybe where, like, like, we're all kind of pushing against something, I think, everybody in this panel. So I'm just wondering, Gabby, I just wanted to give you some space to talk a little bit about, like, how does this fem pedagogy what does it look like um, in the music teacher education? If that's an okay place to start. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks. So I guess what I've seen, uh, in a nutshell, what I've done is I've I've spoke to 12 music teacher educators across the country to see how they engage with liberatory praxis and what they think it is. And one of the biggest things that came forward um, was this relational caring femme approach, which kind of looks like really bringing our whole selves to the classroom, which actually the keynote in your morning um, really touched on that. And it felt extremely applicable um, and intersectional with what it is that the folks in Canada that I interviewed were talking about. Um, in terms of like specific examples from my own practice, um, things that I really work on is, um, which actually relates to the last presentation about this idea of like, how do we learn this without actually doing it, this trial by fire? Um, one of the things we do a lot of is like mock teaching and feedback and like, how do we engage with feedback with each other? How do we engage with giving each other like caring and, and supportive and constructive um feedback in these spaces so that the trial by fire is happening with each other as opposed to um, with community members or in these social action programs. Um, yeah, I mean, my this is the whole topic of my PhD, so I could talk forever. So I'm, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> I'm actually quite overwhelmed by the complexity of this conversation. <laughs> Are there questions from the floor? Gillian. Um, it's a question for everybody, but it's prompted by Anna and Joe's questions that ended their presentation. Um, and I'm going to frame it really as a comment with a kind of question mark at the end because your questions, my first response, looking at those questions and looking at, um, you know, the thinking about the context that you were describing or that you the things you learn from the practitioners is that does this preparation for sim work actually be belong in conservatoires and training institutions at all? And it looks like it doesn't. <laughs> Would you like to elaborate on your thoughts on that? And that could be for the whole panel. Yeah. Well, I can say something, but uh, Joe, uh, you can add what you think. Um, okay. I think, I think uh, it's a big question, Gillian. We think about it a lot. Uh, what I am teaching uh, participatory music practices at the conservatoire, and what I feel, I just give my uh, answer for my feeling, is that this is just one course. But we feel that the competences we have to uh, to uh, to train the, the the students for they are so complex that this can't be reached in one uh, course. So actually, this is our second question. If we if we think it is a it is a task for conservators to to uh, train musicians for this field of socially engaged practice, we think actually that we should change the whole culture and the whole curriculum of the conservator, where because now we are training them to be a solist in an orchestra, for example. This is the first aim, actually. And then this social practice is like on the side. And it is so complex and so important, we think, 
that you cannot uh, you cannot look at it as being one course uh, in a curriculum of five years. So that would be my first uh, answer to your question. Maybe Jo wants to add from her experience. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. And hello, everybody. I'm really sad not to be with you in Brisbane. I would have loved to have been there, but I'm very happy to be online. Um, yeah, similarly to Anne, I think the question, should this work be in conservatoires, is a dangerous question. Um, I'm mindful that um, Anne and I are coming to this as Europeans. The UK is not in the EU, but I'm still a European. But, um, you know, and it's we're really coming to it from this position of um, being outside of the practice in a way that was different to the culturally responsive work of lived experience musicians working in their communities that uh, Deanna and Samantha had presented at the start. So I think that's part of the problem. Um, but the question, should it be in there? Um, I think that it's quite political from a very UK perspective. If it's not in there, then what are conservatoires for? They are to maintain the cultures of competition and non-caring spaces that Gabby has pointed out so brilliantly are, are, are problematic and a sustaining kind of colonialism. So for me, I'm the hopeful community musician that we need to find a way for them to be in there. But my question would be, you know, picking up on um, Deanna and Samantha's presentation about being ready for change and radical responsiveness, um, and then Gabby's being ready for care and, and femme positioning. How can we kind of really, you know, galvanize uh, different ways of working from that kind of, you know, normative, problematic, violent ways that we might see in particular higher education spaces? I will stop now. Very excited. <laughs> Um, I wonder if I could pick it up from here, if that's all right, to the online panel. Um, and I'm going to bring Samantha into this as well. Um, first, thanks, Samantha, for being online. It is 12.30 a.m. in uh, Waterloo, so thank you. <laughs> I appreciate your dedication, as always. Um, uh, so I know why we're on this panel, actually, is that... Um, so I, I coordinate the Bachelor of Music specialization in community music at um, Wilfrid Laurier University, so we actually have a full degree that's focusing on what often um, degrees have maybe a course, like Anne is talking about. Um, it still isn't enough, actually, not nowhere near enough. Um, but I, I am resonant, like that, so that question of does it belong, I think it does because it, it completely shifts what, we're, what education is, what musics are included, who gets to have that post-secondary education, what kind of work is happening, what the meaning of music is. It, it just shifts that whole, that whole dialogue. That doesn't mean that every community musician should be um, get a degree, and it, it doesn't mean that every degree should be about that, I don't think. But I think just having these classes and programs um, opens up that space. Uh, to be able to be thinking about these in very different ways and to be able to invite this kind of complexity in. So I would say it's like I love that my I'm no longer I'm no longer asking like we should change but we can't change we should change but we can't change I don't have to worry about that but I am like but we what are we doing and how do we do this better like it's a very different it's just as hard but it's it's a very different kind of, of joy but I'm, I'm gonna ask Samantha if you want to so the, the project we did is actually my my end game is in that role like how do I design that program so that we're meeting those needs of that cultural complexity? So that so this is backwards. Like who's doing it out there? What are they doing? And how can we how can we um, train students to feel more ready to 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 do good work, to amplify the work that's already happening out there, and to and to be mindful and culturally responsive? Um, but Samantha, I'm going to invite you to um, to say to say from your perspective, who is, was graduate of the undergraduate uh, Bachelor of Music in Community Music program, and now a graduate of our Masters in Community Music program, and has experienced a lot of things outside of those programs. I don't know if you would like to respond from either from our research or from your perspective uh, in those areas. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with. Um, what has been said so far about if if we're not learning in in these programs, where are we learning? Um, and as somebody who um, 
is not like a classically trained musician, I would never have had the opportunity to study music at um, a university level had there not been this other, um, this other, I guess, like path for me to be a part of. Um, but at the same time, like just to, I guess, tie it back into our project, most of the folks that we've worked with so far did not have training in this at an institutional level. Um, as um, the two projects that we focused on in this video, um, the leaders very much were drawing on lived experience that they had from being in these communities for such a long time and then tying in their own musical knowledge that they gained either from um, their own musical practice, from cultural traditions, all that kind of stuff, and, and creating their own practice from that. Um, so I think that um, obviously there are many different ways that we can learn how to be community music practitioners. Um, but I think for me, it kind of comes down to not all of us are going to have, um, the lived experience to be working with certain groups. Does that mean that we shouldn't be working with them sometimes? <laughs> yes, I do think that's the case. Like I look at the, the, um, project in Kahiwin, um, Everyone that they work with in that project um, is Indigenous. They're not all from the same nation, but all of them were Indigenous. And that lived um, knowledge and that lived experience of being Indigenous was integral to that project. Um, but then I look at the, um, the Music from Hope project. And yes, Noor and Tarek were both refugees, but both of them... And both of them said that their experience as refugees was important, but both of them also said that this is the kind of work that like you, it doesn't require lived experience. So if if that's the fact, how are we going to be training people to be doing this kind of work if not um, in in institutions or in music schools? So, yeah, I'll leave that there.